how did the Aral Sea go from the fourth largest lake on the planet to a toxic wasteland in only the last 60 years? And why is the same thing happening to Lake Chad in Africa, the Great Salt Lake in the US, and countless others. Altogether, around 35,000 square miles of lakes have vanished since the 1980s. But lakes have always been coming and going. In fact, 10,000 years ago, when Stone Age humans were first starting to practice agriculture, the biggest lakes in Africa were in the middle of what is now the Sahara Desert. In prehistoric times, much of the western US and California were lakes as well. If you go back far enough, even most of Central Asia was once a great inland sea. So if lakes are always coming and going, is it actually just normal that these lakes are vanishing? Over thousands of years, it is normal to see some lakes drying up while others grow, but we've been in a period of unprecedented environmental change as humans divert vast quantities of water, replace natural ecosystems, and burn fossil fuels that have caused our Earth to heat up faster than ever before. It's easy to call human intervention in these systems a crisis. In fact, for the people who once lived on the coast of the Aral Sea, it's hard to call it anything but a crisis. For most of human history, the sea was a source of life, providing fishing and therefore livelihoods to the local communities. But in the 60s, the Soviet government implemented a new policy, diverting the water that normally flows into the lake for irrigation. They turned the surrounding desert into cotton fields. The new crops provided some short-term economic growth, but over time, soils were depleted, forcing farmers to use more pesticides and fertilizer to try and squeeze out as much yield as possible. Cotton farming is still to this day an important industry in Uzbekistan, but the damage it has caused to the Aral Sea is hard to imagine. What was once a calm sea providing habitat for over 300 species of birds is now a toxic wasteland. Since the water that once flowed into the lake carried toxic runoff, the dust left behind on the lake bed contains carcinogens like arsenic and cobalt. The region is plagued by salt storms, causing major health problems for nearby communities. Unfortunately, this isn't the only lake that has been drained dry by humans. To the south of the Aral Sea, on the border between Afghanistan and Iran, Lake Kamun suffers the same challenges. For thousands of years, the local people lived in balance with the wetlands, using it to irrigate the otherwise dry desert. But in the 1900s, the growing population transformed the lake to irrigate the area more aggressively. As a series of droughts hit around the year 2000, the wetlands dried up completely and have not recovered since. In its place are salt flats and sand dunes. The winds that once carried birds to the lake now blow sand that has submerged over 100 villages since the lake dried. But not all lakes diverted for agriculture result in disaster. In the 1800s, a large lake and wetlands occupied much of what is now the southern central valley of California. Before settlers arrived, the lake sustained a large population of Yokuts people who fished on reed boats and hunted deer in the rich wetland habitat. As settlers took over the land, gradually more and more water was diverted for agriculture. Several dams were constructed upstream and canals were built to redirect water for irrigation and municipal use. By the 1900s, the lake was nearly dry. However, the remnants of the lake look very different from Lake Hamoon or the Aral Sea. The Tulare Lake Bed is now productive farmland, not a toxic wasteland. Why are they so different? Salt. As rivers flow, they dissolve minerals, like salt, and usually dump them into the ocean. But in the case of Lake Hamoon or the Aral Sea, the rivers ended at the lake, which means the lake got salty. As the lakes evaporated, the salt became more and more concentrated, until nothing but dust was left. Lake Tulare, on the other hand, was less salty, since it often overflowed into a river that led out to the sea. So although it's a tragedy that a unique ecosystem and innumerable wildlife have been lost, the Tulare lake bed today mostly just looks like any fertile farmland in the Central Valley, aside from the fact that it's occasionally flooded, like it is as I'm recording this video due to an extraordinarily wet year in California. So far, we've talked about three lakes that have almost entirely vanished due to agriculture, but diverting water for irrigation isn't the only way humans are erasing lakes. The Caspian Sea is the largest inland body of water in the world, bigger than most US states in many European countries. While it is still massive today, it has gradually been shrinking. Although geographically it is close to the Aral Sea, and at one point 
point a long time ago they were even connected, the reasons for its decline are totally different. As the region heats up from climate change, the Caspian Sea has gotten hotter, causing it to evaporate faster. Scientists predict this evaporation will just happen faster and faster as the Earth warms up. Right now, the sea is losing about 3 inches per year to evaporation. Scientists don't fully understand how the sea will change yet, but since it is such a large body of water, the consequences could be dramatic. And that's not the only place climate change is erasing lakes. In the Arctic, climate change has been rapidly draining some bodies of water. The ground in the Arctic is typically frozen solid permafrost that doesn't allow water to drain. But recently, due to increased temperatures and more autumn rainfall, the permafrost has been thawing. Water, once stuck in the lake by frozen dirt, now drains away through new channels eroded into the thawed earth. Melting ice has also caused massive changes in mountain lakes. In the Chilean Patagonia, Lake Cachet too is normally dammed by a large glacier. As climate change melts the glacier, the lake changes fast, melting and refreezing, damming and undamming the river, sometimes multiple times per year. In one melting episode in March 2012, 90 feet of water disappeared overnight leaving just puddles and chunks of ice on the lake bed. Locals are forced to evacuate their families and animal herds on immediate notice as the surrounding area floods. In a way, lakes vanishing due to climate change is nothing new. Although the climate is changing faster than ever now, largely due to humans burning fossil fuels and otherwise changing the environment, lakes have always come and gone as the global climate shifts. The most striking example to me is Lake Chad. About 10,000 years ago, Africa was in what's called its humid period. The Sahara was not really a desert, it was covered by grass. And in the southern Sahara, a massive lake formed, Lake Mega Chad. But over thousands of years, the humid period ended and gradually the Sahara dried out again shrinking the lakes dramatically. Today, in the country of Chad, the remnants of Lake Mega Chad are simply called Lake Chad. It's much smaller than it once was during the human period, and in recent years it has been shrinking faster than ever. Since the 1970s, the lake has shrunk dramatically due to a mix of both climate change and overuse of water for agriculture. The Great Salt Lake in the western US follows a similar story to Lake Chad. About 30,000 years ago, large lakes covered much of the US states of Utah and Nevada. The biggest lake, known as Lake Bonneville, was larger than Switzerland. As the Earth warmed up from the peak of the last ice age, the lake shrank into what is now called the Great Salt Lake. More recently, due to the mega drought in the western US, the lake has shrunk to about a third of its peak 1987 size. After hearing me describe these shrinking lakes, you might reasonably assume that Earth is losing all its lakes, that Earth's land masses are on track to potentially dry up entirely. But surprisingly, the amount of surface lake water has actually gone up in recent years. Although all the lakes I mentioned are vanishing, some lakes are getting bigger and new ones are being formed or, more often, built. Countries all around the world have been building more and more reservoirs to store water and have control over when that water is released. Although they are controversial and can cause ecological damage, Dams and reservoirs are an important way for us to manage water in the modern world. And reservoirs aren't the only reason surface land water is increasing. In Tibet, lakes are actually getting bigger due to climate change. The glaciers of the Himalayas are melting fast, feeding the rivers and lakes of the region enough to increase surface water by 20% since the 1980s. As you can tell, we're in an era of unprecedented change in our environment. Humans are changing everything, sometimes for the better by building reservoirs that provide water for growing populations, but often for the worse, ending in disasters like what we've seen in the Aral Sea. If we want to ensure that future generations have enough water and a habitable planet, it's not that we must entirely stop interacting with the environment. It's just that we need to be very careful about it, using proven techniques that are beneficial for both humans and the ecosystems that support us. We should keep the reservoirs that provide water for us to drink, but we should still let some of that water flow downstream to prevent toxic lake beds from forming. We should of course plant the crops we need, but only where there's enough water to sustainably grow them. And when it comes to the global warming evaporating lakes, we of course need to stop burning fossil fuels and transition rapidly to clean energy. At REN, the company I co-founded, we fund solutions that are a win for people and the planet. For instance, rainforest protection programs that protect indigenous rights, or refrigerant collection programs that provide local jobs fighting climate change. As a species, we've spent the past 100 years destroying our planet. We need to spend the next 100 years healing it. Go to REN.co if you want to join our community and see how you can make a difference healing the planet.